God, you are our hope. You are all that we need and all that we desire. Father, you are the one who gives us the strength, the opportunity to make every day yours. You're our brother, our redeemer, our help, our strength. In these days of unknowns, we pray, God, that you will always be the known in our lives. You'll be the strength of our every moment, for you alone give us hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you got me now, Jeffrey, all right, great. If you got your Bibles, please turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We're going to continue our look into the book of Acts. Call it, This is God's House. We know that God can live in a house, but I, I, it's a great old song. It's a, this is God's house. And as we look at Acts, it really is the beginnings of the church, the beginnings of his house. And so this is our opportunity to look and see how God has uh, make, made our church his. What makes it different? What makes it tick? And so... I, I, as we look along through these chapters, I know we're going to find out some things. It's been a crazy time for us, our days, in these um, days of pandemic, days of unrest. It's been crazy for us. And I was thinking about this time in the early church. It was a crazy time for them as well. Probably a good 50 or 60 days for the early church, they didn't know what was going to happen next. Think about it. Starting maybe with the life <clears throat> of Lazarus and the raising of Lazarus and what a difference that that made during the um, during the church. Let me check something. I want to make sure I'm recording. Am I recording? Yeah, I'm going to look really odd there. But that I am recording. <laughs> that was just for you that wanted a close-up of me today. But anyway, the, the raising of Lazarus started an incredible amount of buzz around the Jerusalem area. And then it wasn't long after that, they went into, the, into Jerusalem and the great triumphal entry. Everything looked great, such highs. And then by the end of the week, Jesus is crucified. And every hope that they had had in this man called Jesus was gone. So they went from a very big high to an incredible low. And then they had the word three days later that he's alive. And once again, they have great hopes. And, they, and Jesus walks with them for about 40 days, talks with them, teaches them, gives them all kinds of, of assurances of who he is. And then at the end of that, he disappears, ascends into the heavens. Ups and downs, they're going back to their upper room and they're waiting and they're not knowing what's happening. And it's, it's just a crazy, crazy time. And then the craziest of all things happens. As they're in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, as we talked a couple of weeks ago, there is a like a, a mighty rushing wind and tongues of fire. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes and enters into the church, into the people of the church. And what do they do? Well, they don't do anything for themselves, but they immediately run outside. They go outdoors and they begin telling others about Jesus. Remember, there's an international gathering there. Because it was Pentecost and a, and a great uh, festival time, <clears throat> many people from all over the world, and you can go back and look at all those nations, had gathered there. And so there were lots and lots of different languages. And what these people, these 120 people did, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they went outside and began speaking in their languages about who? Let's talk about Jesus. Exactly why. Why were they doing that? Because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? It's not to give you comfort. It's not to heal your ills. It's not to tell you what you should do next. But the number one purpose of the Holy Spirit is to reveal Jesus Christ in your life. 
And so, here's the Holy Spirit, and he is revealing Jesus, and they, because they are filled with the Holy Spirit, they run out and they tell people about Jesus. Exactly. Because I do just what they're influenced by. Now, it's so interesting. If you go back, I think it's about verse 13. <clears throat> As they were talking to all of the people in that area, in the various languages, many were amazed. Because you would talk to somebody in one language, you turn to another, and they would understand it in another language. It was, it was just fascinating, unbelievable kinds of things happening here, all about this resurrected Jesus. But there were some who didn't believe. There were some that were very skeptical, and maybe they were not being talked to. But they overheard the crowd, and so they said, oh, I know their problem. These Galileans, they're a bunch of old, old hicks, and they're, they're drunk on new wine, which means cheap wine. They're, they're drunk before even we get to noon time. Well, they were under the influence, but not the influence of a bottle. They were under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And what they did is they told them about Jesus. And that's where we have, uh, as we get to verse 14. Now, what they were doing in verse 14, when we see Peter and all of them talking, is that they were talking about the good news. Now, if you go back and and you look in the New Testament, you'll find that the word for the gospel or the good news is a word in Greek called evangelion. And you can see pretty quickly, you would get evangelism right out of it. That's what the word means. It means good news, but it's interesting where that word comes from. It doesn't come from the church. It comes from a Greek culture. And so they basically take that word and apply it to the church. See, what it meant back in those days, an evangelist, not in the church, but an evangelist in Greek culture, was someone that came from a city that was under siege. You see, back in those days, <clears throat> as you would go as a warring country, you would go city by city. And so you would know, if you were at the end of the countryside, as those cities begin to fall, you better get yourself ready for war. And so you would fortify your walls and you would train your soldiers and you would do your best. But if you knew that enemy was terrible, you knew that it was going to be hopeless. And then it just so happened that the city before your next city where you live, they held it and they defeated the enemy. And the enemy was no longer a threat. And so an evangelist would go to that city and tell them the good news that the war is over. That you don't have to fight for yourself. That it has been won by somebody else. And so the early church takes over that good news, Evangelion, and that it is exactly what they're talking about that morning. The good news that there is hope for you. You're trying your very best. You've got a job. You, you've got friends. You're, you're trying to take care of your health. You're doing all of these things and you feel like you're a failure. And it is true. You're fighting a losing battle. But it's okay. Because we have a living hope, as we're saying about this morning. And it is Jesus Christ. And that is good news. First expression of the good news was on that first day of Pentecost. And Peter gets up and defines it for us. He gets up and he begins to defend what they believe and the uniqueness of the gospel. And the center of that gospel is Jesus. Now, what we're going to do is look at this sermon. <clears throat> and it is the very first sermon preached in the New Testament outside of what Jesus has done. It's the first sermon of the church. And he lays out for us beautifully what Evangelion is, what the good news is. So I, I want to point out these about five or six points to you that is what we believe in, is what we trust in, is what we hope in, is what we're getting through our every day because of. So let's start in verse 14. Peter stood up with the eleven. 
that was the other apostles that were there, he stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, now these are the ones who were saying that they're a bunch of drunks, fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only nine in the morning. That's interesting. But the very first sermon that is, that is preached is in defense of someone being called drunk. And it brings about the good news. Now, before we even look at the good news, let me point out something that's obvious to you. Who is speaking? Is Peter. What is Peter known for? Well, for us, he's known for being quite the failure, right? He's the one that stood up and said, I'll, I'll never leave you, Jesus, and within hours denied who Jesus even was, especially to himself. He's the one that, that always spoke more than he followed through on. He's a failure, fearful, boneheaded. He is a hard head that seemed to be going nowhere. Now, I point all that because if Peter could get up and speak, so could you, and so could I, if the Spirit of God has filled your heart. See, it's not, he's not working under Peter's power anymore. He's working under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, why is that? Well, two things that Peter did that you and I could do to be bold with the good news. He did two things. He, he hung out with Jesus, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in these days when we are, you know, having to be uh, uh, quarantined at home, we've hung out with Netflix, and, and we've been filled with something not too holy. And it's change. You see, what we're filled with is what we're going to express in our hearts. And, and all of a sudden, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, because he's been with Jesus, he speaks out. And here's what he says in verse 16. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. Joel being one of the prophets of the Old Testament. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's kind of interesting. Let's look at this. It's, Peter begins to explain why these people are speaking as they are in these various tongues. What in the world is happening? It's not because of alcohol. It is because of something else that's happening. And so what Peter does immediately, and again, he's being led by the Holy Spirit, but also he knows these things because, again, he's hung out with Jesus and he's, he's read his Bible, which is the Old Testament to us. And so he connects what's happening to Jesus with the scriptures 400 years earlier. You see, what, I, what they believe, and what the Jews and we too believe, is that there were no new prophets, no new prophecy at all for 400 years after Malachi being the last one in the Old Testament. There's nothing more after that. And so what he does, he goes right back to one of the most important to the Jews prophecies in the Old Testament, and that was Joel. Remember Joel and all the prophets were writing to Israel who was experiencing all kinds of problems and they were being overrun and overruled. And they were looking forward to, to the day where God was going to come back and we were going to be on the throne and we were going to be powerful one more time. And so Joel was highly fond of it. So he begins to say, this is exactly what Joel was talking about in the last days. Now, Peter had heard a lot of things about the Holy Spirit from Jesus. He was the comforter, the, the advocate, the one who was coming when Jesus left. Jesus' last words, some of his last words is, you shall receive 
power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. He understood that there was something that had happened that was more than just a little bit of the Holy Spirit. It was a whole bunch of the Holy Spirit. It was a pouring out of the Holy Spirit. He connected it immediately to what's happening with Joel in the Old Testament. It was interesting. And, and, and uh, Jim and I were talking. He said he was talking about uh, Tony Evans. He watched Tony Evans this morning. Man, what a great preacher he is. And he was saying that the Holy Spirit's a little like the experience that he had going with his family up to Niagara Falls. He said when he got to Niagara Falls, he looked at his hotel room and he said, man, that is a beautiful, it's an impressive place, this Niagara Falls. But the next day he got out and he, and he got close to it, he got a little mist on him and he said, wow, I can, I can even hear the power of, 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 the, of the Niagara Falls. This is really something. But the next day he got in that made of the mist boat where they give you a, a raincoat and umbrella and the whole thing. And, and he said, man, that, that, you felt and experienced the power of Niagara Falls. He said, there's too many in church that are kind of like that. They, they come and, and they say, hi, I'm the Holy Spirit. That's really nice. There are others that feel a little bit, but we want to feel the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Peter was experiencing at this time. He said, Joel talked about, he said, it's not a sprinkling of the Holy Spirit. It is the pouring of the Holy Spirit. And this is the last day. He said, wait a second. That's 2,000 years ago. It's the beginning of the last days. You look at the news today. And you know, you can say, and we all say, it's the last days we hope. I was hearing somebody out in the hallway saying, and I just can't wait till Jesus gets back. And that's the truth. But we are living in the last days. Everything that's happening, our world is not going to get better and better and better. It's going to get worse and worse and worse until one day Jesus says, I'm here. And that's... The power of the Holy Spirit, as He pours upon us, He reminds us that we're in the last days, that Jesus knows what He's doing. We live in the already and not yet period of time. You, did you see what He said there? That, that the moon is going to turn to blood and the sun was going to go dark. I remember as a kid, I really, I still remember this today. I was probably about 10 years old and I grew up in church. So I, I heard this verse about the blood turning to the moon, the moon turning to blood, and oh man, I remember driving down with my mom and dad to Kentucky one day. We wanted to visit down there with grandma and grandpa, and as we were going, there was a, a, a strange kind of reflection on the moon, and it turned kind of orange. You've seen that before? And I thought, oh no, it's the last day. I really did. Still remember that today. But that's not happened yet. And I don't exactly know what that means, but it's going to be a cataclysmic event. But it hasn't happened yet. What does that mean? It means that when Jesus came, it started the last days, and one day those last days will be finished. You and I are living in the last days. Now, when, and when Peter says and quotes from Joel, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, you can just hear all those Jewish believers saying, Amen, because we've called on the name of the Lord. And that's where he gets them. Because he says, let me tell you who that Lord is. In fact, what follows is the most graphic and, and maybe the most important expression, especially in the early church, of what the good news is, what the gospel is, what the essence of this is. So let's start. Look in, in verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by, a, by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. What's the first thing? Is the incarnation. That's the first step, the first expression of the good news is that Jesus was real flesh and blood. He is God in the flesh. Now, if Peter wanted to start a great movement, he would not put it this way. Because the Jews 
would never believe in a man who claimed to be God. And the Gentiles would never believe in a God who became a man because that man was unimportant. He's talking about aspects of something that no one in the world would believe. And yet he is saying this Jesus was God working in him. Now, some of might be saying, okay, I get that. Uh, God worked through him. He was kind of a miracle man. Uh, I, I can understand that. But he's, he's going to go a little further, isn't he? And, he? and at this point, he's saying, now, you all know it. You all that were here, you saw it. You saw the miracles. You understand that. Remember, Lazarus' raising wasn't that far removed from this time period. Jesus was really real. That's the incarnation. The second thing is the crucifixion. Verse 23. <clears throat> Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. He was incarnated. He was God in the flesh. And you saw God working through him. And then you took him and you crucified. Now it's kind of interesting. He says that this was God's plan. The crucifixion was God's plan. That means that God knew what was happening here. God had already sent. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And that's what he, that was the plan. And that was the redemption plan from the beginning before the beginning of time. That God would send his son. However... The people who nailed him to the cross are guilty of what they did. By the way, it's not just those Jews, but who was guilty? You and I are guilty of nailing him to the cross. The incarnation, the crucifixion, but then the next critical thing. Because there were a lot of people who were crucified. There were a lot of people who claimed to be a, a Messiah, a, a miracle worker. But the next thing is the resurrection. Verse 24. God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me in Hades or hell, or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the paths of life to me. You will fill me with gladness in your presence. Now here is the most stunning truth claim of them all. And everything hangs in the balance on this one part. Incarnation, anybody can say that. Crucifixion, lots of people went through that. But no longer dead. Only Lazarus could do that. By, and by this time, he's already said, but I'm going to see the grave once again. Here is Jesus who said that death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. By the way, this separates Jesus as a religious leader from every religious movement in the world from the beginning of time on. Because every religious leader and every religion points you to a system of keeping laws or, or ethics so that you'll be acceptable and righteous. But Jesus comes along. He doesn't say, let me show you the way to the God, but rather I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life and no man can come to the Father except by me. Now, if Jesus is not alive, if he is dead, then the good news is not good news. The good news is simply a lie. The resurrection, and please get this in your heart and your head, is a non-negotiable. If Jesus is alive, it changes everything. And by the way, if you want a study on that, I did a couple for our students. You can, I, if you want, I'll give you that link. 
I'll give you a video so you can do it, but it's the most important thing here. Consider where Jesus, where Peter is speaking. He's speaking in front of a bunch of Jewish people, many from Jerusalem, who had been in Jerusalem for all these weeks, and nobody in the crowd says, it's not true. They knew that there was a fact in what Peter was saying. Now, how does Peter lay out his case for Christ? Well, let me point it out. First of all, he, Peter speaks scripturally. This passage that he's talking about, where David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me, is Psalm 16. There's a big word, if you uh, followed our Wednesday night Bible study, I, I said I'd use it again this, this morning. The word is Christocentric. It's a great word. You can spell it any way you want to, it'll be okay. <laughs> But it just means that Jesus is the center, Christocentric. And it means that when we read Old Testament, it's what we would consider Old Testament, that the Old Testament is not just for your moral kind of rules and how you should live your life. We do that. I, that's kind of our Sunday school understanding how we grew up with, uh, with David and Goliath and, and Moses and, and, and all those kinds of things. But what happened on the road to Emmaus, back in Luke, at the end of Luke, when Jesus is resurrected, remember he takes the, the, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus aside. They're confused about what had happened. He said, let me show you. And he opens up the scripture. He opens up Moses and the prophets, and he shows them how everything had to be accomplished in order for redemption to take place. He said that everything that you see in the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus Christ. Either the Bible is a bunch of rules about us and what we need to do, or it reveals a Jesus who fulfills all those rules and gives to us eternal life. And it is that. It is Christocentric. Let me give you just a couple of, of things. Abraham and Isaac. It's not just about obedience of giving a son. It points to God who gives his son and his hand is not held back from giving it. Moses is not just a great leader who's redeemed, dreaming, redeemed a people out of slavery into freedom, but it points to Jesus who leads us out of sin into true freedom. It's not just David standing in Israel and risking his life to defeat giant on behalf of the people, but it's Jesus giving his life to defeat this giant of sin and death for all of the people. It's not the priest just offering a lamb for our sin, but it is the Son of God who becomes our high priest and becomes the Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world. When you look in the Old Testament, everything points to, and here's Peter. I don't know that Peter got this until he connected what Jesus was, what he did, and then the Holy Spirit inspiring him. And he said, oh yeah, you got Joel, but you got Psalm 16, by the way. And here's what David said. And it wasn't about him. It was about Jesus. He speaks scripturally. And Peter speaks logically. Look at verse 29. Brothers and sisters. Talking about David now. <clears throat> in the Psalm 16. He said, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried. And his tomb is with us to this day. We know where it is. Since he was a prophet, in other words, what he's saying is in Psalm 16, he was speaking prophetically. He knew that God had sworn an oath to him to see one of his descendants on the throne, seeing what was to come. He spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. So he's saying, let me, let me interpret this scripture for you. Let me take this Psalm 16 and explain it to you. David's not talking about David. He's talking about something else. How do I know? Well, logically, it goes this way. David's dead. And his body decayed. We know where his tomb is. is. We, we go by and, and talk about the good days when King David was the king. He's dead and gone. He's not talking about himself. He's talking about the one who is yet to come. 
the descendant of David who would sit upon the throne forever and ever. This is the Messiah that he's speaking about. He is the descendant that David had spoken of. He speaks logically and he speaks personally. Here we go, verse 32. God has raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. He's starting to bring it down. Bring, take that ne next verse up there. There you go. He's bringing it down. He's saying, I want to explain to you who we are, what we're doing. And by the way, here's this Jesus. And here's what he's talking about. Even David is talking about. But he's not done yet. Peter next speaks of the ascension. Verse 33. Therefore, since he's been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the, the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you can see and hear. Since he has ascended, since he has been exalted, since he has gone up into the heavens, he has sent down the Holy Spirit and we are the ones. There's one more. The gospel, the good news, is the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, and the exaltation. Verse 34. For it was not David who ascended into heavens, but he himself says, The Lord declared to my Lord. In other words, David is talking about someone who is above him. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And a hush fell on the crowd. The conclusion. Here's the good news. The gospel. The same Jesus that you crucified was sent by God as God in the flesh to die in your behalf and was raised from the dead, because of his obedience, Jesus has been declared to be both Lord and God and Messiah. This is who we're talking about. That's who we need to talk about too. What was the result? Look at the next verse. Verse 37. <clears throat> when they heard this, they were pierced or cut or stabbed to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, as many as the, as the Lord our God will call with many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 people were added to them. They were cut to the heart. When they got down and he finally said, This is the good news, and you're the ones who crucified him, they said, Oh my. It was us. Now, what's interesting is that many of these people were not there when Jesus was crucified. Because remember, Pentecost was a big festival day, and a multitude of people had come outside of Jerusalem, so many of them were not there. So it wasn't just those who actually literally crucified Jesus, but it was everyone that was there. They were cut. It literally means they were stabbed to their hearts. That means that they were absolutely under conviction. Now, what happens when you're under conviction? One of two things happen. Either you just kind of fritter it away and explain it away, or you say, what can, what can we do? What must I do? I'm cut to the heart. I know I need Jesus Christ in my life. Friend, you may be here today, and, and you've experienced that before, but you just kind of sloughed it off and gone your way, and you've not done anything with the convicting power of the Holy Spirit in your life. What did they do? Let me give you four things that they did. First of all, he says, repent. Repent. That has to do with your mind. In fact, the, the word really means to change your mind, to turn it around, 
to change your thinking. Remember, he goes at them in a logical way. He doesn't just say, he's a great man, you ought to believe in him, but let me tell you exactly who he is and what he did and what he means. Change your mind, change your thinking, change your understanding. It begins, you know, the old phrase, the, the penny drop. There was a change in my understanding. And the second thing is receive. And that has to do with the heart. Is the heart received? Put that next one up there. Is it received? And that, that has to do with the heart. The seed of, of all that you are, your dreams, your aspirations, your, your hopes, your future, the things that bring you prosperity and joy in your life. And he says, it begins to change that thing. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as he begins to change you at the heart root level. And the third thing he says is identify. Baptism. Now some of our uh, Church of Christ friends, and I, I have no problem with that because I understand where they are, but they take this and say, well, you've got to be baptized in order to be saved. I don't think that's the case. However, I don't think you'll ever find anyone in the New Testament who was saved who wasn't baptized. So I, I think, you know, those two things go together. But what's happening, remember, where they are, they're in a Jewish setting. Baptism was there. You, you'll find baptismal pools in Jewish settlements from that period of time. You would only baptize someone for one of two things because they were not Jewish and they want to become Jewish or someone had really gone far astray and they want to say, I, I, need to, I need this baptism. It was an identification. You remember what John the Baptist said, I want you to come and be baptized. It was a totally different baptism. He said, I want you to be identified with a message that I'm speaking. And here exactly is what he's saying. I want you to come out from them, change your mind, change your heart, and identify with this message, be baptized. And the last thing is an honor. He says, I, I want you to be to be saved from this corrupt generation. I want you to live your life as an honor and as a testimony of who Jesus Christ is as he's touched your heart, your mind, you, you've given your life to him and for him, and your life will never be the same again. This is all a result of the Holy Spirit movement in the midst of the people. And how many people came to the Lord? 3,000 people that day. Started a movement in that little tiny place that literally, literally put the world upside down in the coming centuries. It was an amazing thing. Why? Because they wanted something to happen good. Because they, they thought this was a great idea and let's, let's, let's make this happen. No. It was because, number one, it was true. It was of God and the Holy Spirit moved them. Can it change our church and the churches around us? We say, man, you know, I'm with you. Like, well, you know, we're struggling in the first place, and then we get this pandemic. I don't know what's going to happen next. And how are we ever going to? Wait a second. Have we given up upon God? Have we said, God, I'm just not so sure we're up to this anymore. I'm not so sure you're up to this anymore. I guess we're just going to live this way. No. We need to come back to a Holy Spirit dependence upon God and a willingness to speak up in those moments where God gives us those moments to speak up. It's exactly what happened with, with Peter. He may not have said anything if someone hadn't said, I don't know what's going on, you bunch of yahoos, what's wrong with you? Peter said, let me tell you some good news about the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, and the exaltation that our Lord reigns. And I am a child of God. Man, if you're, if you're a child of God today and you believe that in your heart and you live that in your life, there is nothing that can disturb you, perturb you, move you. Move with that recognition every day of who you are in Christ. Well, as we close this morning, I'd love again to you use the uh, connection card and share that. Mark, by the way, 
Somebody forgot to put any offering plates back there. Could you put some offering plates back there before? I didn't see that back there. I don't know. That was my probably my fault, but we want to make sure that we got that. And if you put that in the offering plate, if you uh, have a question or a decision or a need, I'm looking forward to being able to having a, an invitation one of these days, but uh, that's a great invitation too. And as we come, then God will be honored. Thank you for being part of our worship again this morning, and we will uh, we'll go and be a part of, part of what God is doing in our lives. Let's stand together, shall we? And before you uh, before we go, just just go wave at everybody, all right? Just turn around and wave at everybody. It's, and they look good. Some, like I said, some for the first Sunday, and that's so good to have you all back with us and among us. All right, Barry, I'm going to ask if you would to dismiss us in prayer. Let's go with God and enjoy His presence this week, Barry.